Hello everybody and welcome to the show. I once again have Patrick Dixon with me. This is in fact our eighth show. So I said to Patrick, since it is our eighth show, number eight, all other sevens can be found on this channel, we would discuss the eighth sphere because I thought number eight would be an important number to deal with and there's other meanings to the number eight as well. So Patrick, welcome back. Yep, thanks. And uh, where would you like to start with perhaps with the eighth sphere in Rudolf Steiner's spiritual science? Well, yes. I mean, first of all, to understand that within the great evolutionary pi picture that anthroposophy offers, Steiner offers, is there are seven great incarnations of the earth. In contradistinction to mainstream cosmology, which sees planets spatially spaced out, this cosmology depicts transformations. You could say of one planet. There are seven transformations of this world. And as one appears, the, other, the previous one disappears. It's, it's rather like with the butterfly lays an egg, a caterpillar. A the egg disappears, the caterpillar appears. The caterpillar then turns into a chrysalis. The caterpillar disappears. The chrysalis disappears. The butterfly appears. So it's a constant state of transformation and, and there are seven there are seven one was called old saturn the first which laid the foundations of the in a way the physical body it was unlike our world so uh, the only experience you could have of our world was the sensation of warmth cosmic warmth which i've said before is really when spiritual or soul warmth that we have a warm person and physical warmth warm blood were in a sense one, these two kinds of warmth were one, just as light, spiritual light and physical light, what we call physical light, were not yet divided. This division between these things is, a, is to do with the interception of certain adversarial beings, Lucifer being one of them. But within this great cycle, we're now of seven great incarnations. We're now in the fourth, which is the earth the earth condition of consciousness. These great incarnations really describe conditions of consciousness. And they go on for a very long time. I mean, like five million years, and a condition of consciousness is supposed to take place. But now we, it's almost like we've come down. It's like, imagine this kind of valley, which we've descended into on one side from the ancient primordial old Saturn, a highly spiritual thing, which is the gods existed within. The human didn't exist as a conscious entity, but gradually descended into the next, which is the old sun. And each descent, something is added, which will eventually reach completion when we've descended to the bottom of the valley, which is, you could call it, the valley of the shadow of death, the place where we experience death for the first time. But we also experience the beginning of the resurrection of the eternal human being, the individual. This descent through Saturn, old Saturn, old Sun, old Moon, then Earth, three, is like, <clears throat> imagine, some highly ethereal medium gradually densifying into fluid, or gas, into aerial, into fluid, into solid. The whole descent of these worlds is coming down into this time where we see around us physical world, the world of solid objects and things. We have fluid, we have air, we have all these things, and we have the fully incarnated human being. And then we also have, not only that, all the way down, there was this increasing of consciousness, you know, from the plant world, the animal world, and finally the human world, where you have the full self-consciousness of the human being at the bottom of the valley. That's really where the I am comes. And then you have the threat of death because of this separation from the cosmos. Because after each world, a kind of veil drops, in a way eclipsing consciousness of the previous. And it's only through initiation that one can through the development of imagination, inspiration, and intuition, can one lift the veil 
I mean, Steiner did this. It has been done through mystery schools to see, to get some idea of these previous states and therefore understanding the consciousness, understanding the relative unconsciousness of those beings, giving a consciousness of the plant, the animal, and then finally the human. But also what was added to the human was an ego. All the other forms were, first of all, the the mineral consciousness, the plant consciousness. The mineral only has a physical body. The plant has a physical mineral body, you could say, and an ether body, a life body. And then the animal has a sensing body. It's conscious, but it's not self-conscious. The climax is self-consciousness at the bottom of the valley of the shadow of death. And all these different levels of consciousness are reach their climax. And then the whole point of that is, and this is where the divine enters in, into this part of the valley, the lowest part of the valley, the densest materiality, to lift it up again, lift up the human being, to consciously climb the ladder back. It's not back, it's forwards, to a recapitulation on a higher level of all the stages by which it has descended. And this is the whole mystery of the divine incarnation, all those which led to the resurrection and the ascension body. And that, and that is something all of our, all human beings who are, accept that are, can participate in this, these processes, which will lead to the gradual ascent through these um, spheres, through the seven, the great seven folding. But also in this process, there are forces that want to prevent that. They know that in a way, the human being has descended into the valley of the shadow of death. And given the certain beings closer access, you could say beings of the underworld, the lower world, they couldn't completely take over until the human being had got there. The human being arrived in a place where the human being was extremely vulnerable, but at the same time with a tremendous potential which it never had before. So we've got these two things. And the most vulnerable and the most capable are there together. <coughs> If a human being does not take in the idea of the spiritual ascent, which is coming from the higher dimensions, they will be completely overwhelmed or completely vulnerable to these forces that want to take them in another direction. So imagine at the bottom of this valley, there is something underneath it, another world. We go to the underworld, and it's not, it's not just mythological that... Um, we see the you know the dark worlds being in the underworld. They are really because I mean Steiner points this out that the earth itself is made up of nine interior spheres which descend into greater and greater, you could say amorality or immorality, forces that are inim inimical to life, consciousness and the divine plan, the forces that had to be restrained and contained in a way within the interior of the earth until humanity was capable of, with their full consciousness, penetrating and transforming them. If they don't do that, this other world will form. I mean, it's also connected very much with the whole philosophy of materialism. You know, we know the 12, there are 12 philosophical systems, 12 isms, you could say. Materialism is one of them, and we're passing through that now. <laughs> and it's very important, because we have to eventually master it, and we have to bring it under the service of the higher ego, which is imbued with higher spiritual creative forces. If we don't do that, then what happens is that materialism becomes the only ism, and it actually overarches all others. And what it will do, it will engulf and swallow up all the previous development that has gone on in the descent into the valley. So all that was developed on old Saturn, old Sun, old Moon, and on the Earth would be taken down and not able to climb the ladder, the Jacob's Ladder of Ascension, up into a new manifestation. <clears throat> and that the materialism of today in materialistic science is really something that could feed that. 
when you, ha when you have to distinguish between the virtues of what has been developed with the human intellect in science in many ways, all the things we use, many of the technologies, the materials we've processed, the ability to heat ourselves in cold places, to warm ourselves, you know, and, and to keep us cool in hot places, and all those things are, in a sense, being given to us by this being Ariman, but allowed because the higher worlds have allowed Ariman to, to work so far. We need it. We need Ariman. Ariman makes us comfortable in a world that is no longer comforted by the direct presence of higher spiritual beings. Lucifer keeps us entertained, you could say, distracted in a world with, you know, we need, we also need that a bit, but only a bit. We need, uh, that's the balance. And the sort of idea of the Christ being coming in the middle is the being that establishes the validity of both those beings. Without Christ, they become invalid and dangerous, and, din and they were counter to the true development of the human being. So, in materialistic science, it has its own potential cosmology, excluding the whole concept of the superphysical, which, if that was to appear, would be like all the cosmic wisdom of the Father, but denying the mystery of the Son, the heart. You imagine this great picture, this huge quantitative picture that modern science, astronomy or particle physics gives us, excising from that any kind of sense of inner reality that develops in the human being. That's, that's, the, that's the picture you'd get if you have the Father without the Son. And that's what, what modern physics particularly now I say this, physics has claimed for itself almost the number one position as being the premier science because it claims to know where everything came from and where it will all go. It gives a permanency to what they call, you know, the atomic theory, the protons, neutrons, positrons, quarks, all this stuff that, you know, that the uh, particle collider works with and astrophysics talks about, gives that the permanency. That is what was there first and that will be the only thing that ultimately will survive. And of course that, that if that was to become really established on the earth, it would create a whole new world in which other beings could take over the human being altogether. It would drive human beings towards things like transhumanism, which means replacing the organic Instead of lifting it into the super-organic, would take it into the sub-organic or the mechanic. So that would be the aim, is to change the whole earth into a machine. Or they, would, they What they can't do, see what will happen is that the earth will evolve and those beings will carry part of the earth with them. But they, this thing that they created, this alternative thing, will be left behind as a place where those who do not acknowledge the spiritual, the higher dimensions, will be, for, will be forced to enter and be a part of, because they have partly built it by their consciousness. And that's, to a certain extent, what one calls the eighth sphere. It's not, it's not legitimate, really, within the greater world evolution. It's a place where that which is not able to evolve is put until those which can evolve higher have the power to go back and r transform and lift those out who are trapped in that sphere. So that's a long way ahead. Well, I find that a lot of people get confused as to what this eighth sphere is made of. So that was brilliant to hear what you've just said because it, so this is sub-organic material it's going to be made of. Because um, some people, I know this is from A.P. Sinnott's book, The Misunderstanding, that he put out there. He said it was the moon. And I still hear people today talking about the ape sphere being the moon, but it's not, is it? No. It is a separate, as you say, it's not part of the evolutionary process of this cosmos. It's something that the adversarial forces are creating a, a side to it. Would that be... Because we don't really know where it is, do we? Well, it's not... It, yeah, I mean, in a sense, it, it, those beings will create a kind of astral, etheric world initially. How much whether it goes into sub-physicality. I mean, it's really, 
it to a certain extent will consist of much of the internal substance world of the in, inside of the earth it will be made out of that in a way but it, the earth will evolve I mean the thing is that human beings at the end of the seventh epoch if they, they are, those who have taken up the spirit will work like a kind of ark they will upload in their consciousness the all the greatness of the earth itself they will internalize it and carry it up into the next level where it will then be externalized again but what is not able to be left behind and will actually harden it will become trapped in that realm it's it's like it is a sub etheric it's substance rather than superstance what the, those beings are going up into the superstantial those others will become trapped in substance they will not they'll be conscious that they're not able to transform it that they're not able to be rise out and free themselves um, and that will only that will last as long as you know these beings are not able to come back and save them from that condition and this is connected with the mystery of electricity magnetism gravity and the nuclear forces I mean electricity in one way you could say electricity it came about through the fall of the luciferic beings and their light fell and became electricity that's what it was and then Ariman hardened it even more and it's it's a horizontally bound element really and all the kind of cosmological projections about the earth's magnetic field and all that stuff is also the product of this fall into the you know the, and it's the uh, fall into this world had not the Christ come that all the stuff we have today would have hardened even more and we wouldn't be able to escape from these concepts but electric they're all they are fallen ethers but they're seen by modern science as the primary forces of the universe they are which of course they're not and this is this goes with materialism which goes with the eighth sphere it's the cosmology of things hence the theory of everything as though a thing is more important than a being mm -hmm. so the whole cosmology of modern science is voided of being and you know I listened to a program about outer space and the whole concept is you know we can find aliens and other planets this is a kind of materialistic misconception or omission of the reality that we are already surrounded by beings we have beings working in us in all different times you know it's like it's a much more sophisticated and deeper thing whereas the, what lays the foundation for the eighth sphere is this idea that what's out there is just out there it's just objects but it's, some, it's under the same kind of laws that we have here that's also an illusion it's not but it's I mean, not is it it's no going to be it's completely under different, different laws. totally different and uh, even though they say, oh, what about going into space? Yeah, you, go in, you can only go so far. And, you know, even in their terms, I've said it loads of times before, you know, they, the, the distances, even the model astronomers and physicists will say, this are so great. But all this stuff about we're going to get to the stars takes thousands of years. And when you look at the Earth now and what the problems we've got now, you know, it's, and it, the fact is the space race is siphoning off massive, all this stuff is siphoning off massive forces from the Earth. You know, so it's, 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 it's an abstraction and it misses the real evolution. The real evolution is the evolution, the co-evolution of the human being with the whole of nature and the, how that comes out of the inner development of the human being. Much was poured into us as we came down into the valley of death. We were receiving wisdom, pouring into us, into all manifestations of nature. It reaches a climax where the adversary can take hold of it waits for it to come down and say wow now we can get it it's close enough for us to grab you know but it but then that's when the Christ is there and says no I give it to you take it back we will lift it all up back up to that that level but that's that's the danger of this the foundations of materialistic science is that it's it's making a harvest which Ariman can reap if yeah. you know we don't wake up but it's a, it's a change of consciousness that is really needed. And call you know what Martin, uh, what Luther, Martin Luther King called the thingification of the world. Very insightful. Well, he called it what the the thingification. The thingification. Thing, 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 thing. Oh, wow. It, because it's very significant that because the whole nature of what we call things 
is that they can be manipulated from the outside. They have no indwelling agency. Whereas what the divine is saying to us, actually, you have the seeds of absolute indwelling agency over all things. I mean, even look around. You see, we're surrounded by things we've made. And they all have purpose. But the beings that make them at this time, I don't know their, what their purpose is. You know, we... We are beings that we have a little purposes, local, little short term purposes. We don't realize our real purpose, but we're surrounded by objects that have purpose, you know, very limited purpose. And that's also what the dark forces want. They don't want us to wake up to the greater purpose. They want us to distract us with smaller purposes, short term vision. Everything is, you know, and also this idea of giving humanity prematurely what they're not ready for. I mean, it's interesting, the whole thing about the internet with this and the dark web is it's like a, you know, it's, it's a huge manifestation of the potential soul world where human beings are in touch with each other across dimensions. But it's given by aromatic forces prematurely and therefore it becomes a conduit for total untransformed astrality. It's given license for human and a freedom that they're not ready to have. You know, let set free the double to vomit its stuff all over the earth. Yeah. You know, I mean that's there it has you know, it has uses and that, you know, it has its uses and can be redeemed and there be beings working in it. Like everything else Araman gives us, it can you know, other forces are at work. Even in our medicine, you know, in a way the mainstream Western model of medicine doesn't really understand the cause of illness. But it's the higher world, the divine, I said, okay, well, let you have these understandings and these can work up to a point. They, you know, for, until you're ready to see the true primary karmic cause of illness and all those things, you know. So that's where we have, we have a level of compromise or understanding how Ariman has his place. It's only when we deny anything spiritual, that's when we help reinforce the eighth sphere, you know, and there are many, many descriptions. I mean, actually, even Daniel Andreev, who wrote this thing, and he was in the gulags, and he describes these different states after death, which are like purgatorial states. I mean, they are, you know, you're, I'm, I've written about this myself, you know, you're like a, you can be in a place where you're, you, you can't walk. You, you literally slowly crawl. You're on, you know, you're, and a whizzing over your head, a kind of, trees that suddenly shed their leaves but they're not like leaves that fall, they shoot like darts across this electromagnetized -magnet plane. You know, you're really caught in these forces that you can't do anything about and that's one of the one aspect of the <coughs> eighth sphere. Also, I mean, you look at Dante's Divine Comedy you know, you've got these nine circles of hell you know, where, I mean, Dante starts out in the dark forest which is very symbolic of our time, the doubt, what, what's true, what's not true, all this disinformation, all this, you know, conspiracy theories here, conspiracy, this, that and the other. To know what is really true, you know, he, he's lost, Dante's lost, until he's found, he found in Virgil, the great poet from the Roman era, he guides him, he says, you've got to go through, you've got to go through the darkness, through the hell, to go beyond, you know, and he guides him through, comes to the gates of hell and he, and he goes into the first level it's called the vestibule of futility you know where you can be doing all sorts of things you're not doing obviously wicked but you're just it's pointless yeah. you know, it's not that, going anywhere yeah not going anywhere and then the, you, it's a way Dante divides up so he says starts out mostly with lust he says those sins he calls to do with the sort of weakness of the flesh you know just so lust you know, you can run about of winds, you know, and then there's gluttony and sloth. And then there's a break, and then you go in. And the other things coming in, then you go down into the city of Dis, where it's like anger and all this wrath, and, you know, this kind of terrible lack of, which goes into violence of all different kinds. And he, as you go lower down, he goes into fraud. He goes into the realm of deception. He's putting that in one of the greatest, all the different manifestations of that. And finally, the final thing, very quick thing, but the final one is interesting enough. He puts at the very base of hell a frozen lake in which <coughs> treachery is the worst thing of all, you know, because you've sworn and you've deceived and then you've turned against, you know, 
I mean, which is a very powerful image, but the, why it's called a comedy is interesting. I mean, the definition of a comedy, in that sense, is that it's all about the eventual integration of the human being. So it's a kind of journey towards self realization whereas a tragedy is all about how one fault brings the demise of the individual, you know, which the Greeks and then the Shakespeare did. Shakespeare didn't, I suppose in a certain extent, he did the comedy thing in The Tempest, you know, <coughs> integration. All great drama, in that sense, is, is a comedy if it leads towards this is a journey towards a greater understanding of that. And you can see Pilgrim's Progress is another mm. one, you know. Um, our shows. Hmm? Uh, let's think of our shows as being a progress towards improving oneself. Yeah, it's not yeah. like, oh, doom and gloom, this is the oh, end yeah, of the world. No, no, We're no. trying to show you how to help yourself so you yeah. don't get caught up in all yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, I mean, the ways of dealing with the eighth sphere, ways of dealing with countering the activity, is to develop, you know, in a way, develop your senses, develop your, develop your memory, the power to recollect, to value to sit and, and think, bring new thoughts into what is obvious. I mean, on one level, while you're this idea of things, you know, objects have purpose in them, but they don't, you know, so you're getting this clarity of disting, distinguishing between elements and looking at materials, you know, recollecting the qualities of materials, some rigid, tense, compressed, you know, plastic, elastic, all this stuff where you're extending your filling your senses with new thoughts when well, you're not just deadening, you're not just taking it for granted you look with interest, you start to awaken wonder at as many things as possible that is countering the eighth sphere, that's the beginning of it so seeing with your spiritual eyes as Rudolf Steiner would say yeah absolutely, I mean you go through the, you know, you go through the stages imagination, inspiration, intuition and even on a very basic level you, know, you work initially visually with the imagination can imagine all kinds of things, structured imaginations. I only do with mathematical models. Just to, I mean, I've made them, but I can see them in my mind and how to construct things in my mind. Then colours, shapes in plants, animals, how they move, you know, even people's faces when you're not with them, trying to recollect their faces, you know, and that recollect their voice. Then you go into sound, voices, bird songs, how to recollect them, you know, to hear them. That's all that stuff counters the eighth sphere. Which I have to quickly jump in and say, my friends lately, because I often go for walks in the woods, mm. and I used to say, let's listen to that bird, listen to that bird. Anyway, some of them have now downloaded this app so they can point it at the bird and it tells them yeah, which yeah, bird yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. And I see that great as a learning curve. Should be a learning curve, yeah. But then they should be learning what that bird's call is so that next time they can go, oh, there's that one again. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, knowing yeah, what it is. Yeah, but instead yeah. they are still relying yeah, on yeah, that yeah. app. So I'm finding it a bit annoying. Though at some point... I do see it beginning good, but they're becoming reliant on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I actually got that on my phone. I mean, I, but I don't hardly use it. I know the, as many bird songs, and I try to know as many as I can, you know, more and more, and get qualities of it so you can recollect it. I do that also with music. I try to, I say, oh, look, that's Haydn. That's ha I can tell, you know, which composers are, gen even with a few mm. bars, usually, you know. And getting more and more of that, you're really developing this thing which then goes into the intuition. You can really, you perceive the way a person thinks, where they're coming from, what that, and that's a form of clairvoyance. And that's, that's what we have to do to, we're immortalizing our higher faculties in that process. But um, the eighth sphere is to dull you down, is to make you dependent on external technology, Stimuli. absolutely. You know, and that's yeah. that's really, and then you are, you are really just an electron moving around, moved around by those forces. You know, I mean, it's like even if you look at something like a laser, it's an interesting thing. All these technological devices have a sort of um, image of the whole Earth in a sense. You said the laser idea is that it's called uh, <coughs> light amplified by stimulated emission of radiation and it's like it's almost like in this tube people are put into a kind of tube it's the image of that people are crowded into something and then they're stimulated and then they activate their own light is taken from them it's like this thing it bleeds you know we get these 
like massive rock concerts and things like that. People are being compressed and then they're being their energy is being taken from them. They think they're supporting something. You can see that actually they're giving something over completely. And, it's, and they, they need more of it afterwards. You know, it's like it's a drug. Yeah. You, are, you are selling out your being. Instead of listening, you know, maybe alone or whatever, it's just something and getting more and more out of less and less. You get, you get less and less out of more and more. You know, so it, it questions this whole large, massive events with you know, all this razzmatazz, you know, it kind of, not always, but, you know, it's something which you ought to be very careful of, because they're actually farming human etheric forces off human beings in those environments, especially when, especially when somebody's almost worshipped, they're put on a pedestal, you know, which some yep. people are in the music world, you know. And you can see it all happening, actually, and, like, you can see it in various concerts, how everyone's just kind of spellbound, and like you say, giving all that energy and clapping, yeah, whoa. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then they come away and it's like they've come off a drug or something. Like they're all happy going home and then the next day they can't wait to tell everyone. But it's like a, it's a herd mentality at the same time. But it's taking, like you say, taking that energy. So that's going into the eighth sphere oh, to yeah, help yeah, build all that it. Stuff is, yeah. So that's our energy going into yeah, it. Yeah. Do we ever as a person, is that when we die could people go into it if you're not spiritually developing yourself well if you if yeah if you have i mean there's a lot of mercy you know this idea if you repent or you you know you repent you pent up again what has been given out you and recover but and you know that's why the divine the divine christ being is always able to forgive put right we spoke earlier about the karma lord of karma that is really how it works but you know there must be but if you go out and you're still in that kind of denying phase, then it's you are easy meat for the, those forces to take you over in various different ways. I mean, we know that, in a sense, the Western brotherhoods are particularly feeding off these huge events. They are because they're preparing from that how to announce and propagate the concept of the. Aramanic incarnation as being the Messiah, as being the saviour of the world. That's that's how they they will they're bringing this mass consciousness, this you know, and they, through music, through light, through all this stuff is just a dazzle, and you know, oh wow, you know. So it's at the same time they're creating a world outside these events which is boring and tedious, and you need that you need these huge events or you need the oasis because you're in a desert where the oasis is poisonous you know and that's that's and the opposite of that is when you you know which is working as well in the world people going into mindfulness people realizing you know that the real joy of existence is waking the creativity in yourself you know in that way and then sharing it in the right way the trouble is a lot of very talented people are caught up in what I call, somebody described Michael Jackson as being a Luciferic angel caught up by Aramanic archangels. You know, because the, um, the whole industry, music, film, Hollywood, all this stuff is a massive machine behind which the more Aramanic guys, the producers, the money people are controlling, you know, you're not doing what we want, so you, you lose that job. You know what I mean? There yeah. is so much of that. And you've got to admire some of the actors get through in their integrity and you know, in already all right, you know, they've got through, they've gone through some terrible temptations and, uh, you know, so many fall by the wayside, partly for a while, you know, alcohol, drugs and all that stuff. It's very, very dangerous to have massive adulation, you know, and yeah. have it amplified through film, you know, because in a way, you know, these film stars and things, what they've been given to a certain extent is like a, an Aramanic ascension body, you know, sort of, or a resurrection body, where they're like gods, are seen all over the earth. Well, they've been miserably sitting at home smoking a joint or something. Their image is the god, you know what I mean? You are, you're everywhere, you know, you're, it is what will happen, what is possible in the distant future through the development of the human being is being given in that way. But then they come back to reality and it's, you know, they live on that fantasy level and then they have to come deal with that. So. They get trawled, pulled into all sorts of things. I mean, I think I think about Taylor Swift. What you know? 
I don't really know much about her. She seems quite level-headed in a way, but it's, it's in very dangerous for the soul, you know, that can be. And some of them definitely have gone over, you know, to, to the, the other side. There's no doubt about that. But <laughs> well, you can see also with a lot of actors that have, and, and music stars that have gone to the other side, and then they try to find their way back, they're just so fallen. It's like they have... Um, it, they can't give up that fame because they love oh, that yeah, adoration. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like an yeah. uh, addict again, isn't yeah, it? It's yeah. another drug, ad adoration. Um, you know, I was reading just the other day about Ruby Wax was saying about how she's not famous anymore. She can't get a table at a restaurant kind of example. Yeah, but yeah. it's like, so that must be quite a weird... Though she, she was saying it in that she was relieved she was like that. But for mm, some mm, people mm, that mm, are so mm. big-headed or love that... Yeah. lifestyle or perhaps we're in it from a childhood mm. uh, you know I know like people like Britney Spears and that they broke down didn't they but she was in that realm from a young age being built up built up built up so they're put on that pedestal and that's something again wouldn't that be something our man was trying to do to them kind of people put you on your pedal yeah. stool inflate your ego oh, yeah, yeah. which is not spiritual work is it no no i mean it's, it's that is a preparation for the big show you know what i call the day of manifestation and what i call the god the global organizing director you know which that's really you know where they're trying out how how they can get one being to have such a massive effect they once they've used you they just drop you you know that that's the, the ruthlessness of it really and the drugs and all that stuff is brought in as a sort of, to, you know, a barn to keep you into it. And yeah, I mean, it does, becomes an addiction. And, you know, how do you go back to normal life? It's very, very difficult when you've had that. People manage it. I mean, the sports as well. People, have, you know, I think that sports is different because you get, you know, you have a limited time working in that kind of physicality. And then you may have been, you know, a lionized and, you know, put on a pedestal and then suddenly it's all gone. I even thought of the other day, it was quite interesting, <laughs> even after the election I thought, you know, Rishi Sunak leaving the, one minute you're Prime Minister, and the next minute you're just Joe So, you know, yeah. you're just, you know, going home at night and he's just thinking, blimey, I, you know, I was number one and now I'm nothing, and then, and then Keir Starmer going in there from being, and I'm now, I'm, wow, you, know. you think, you don't imagine what that is like, I mean, it's, you know, I think, in a way, both of those men were quite balanced in some ways, whatever else you think about their politics. You know, so they're not, but you see how it does happen to people. I mean, it happens to dictators who get completely out of control, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's, that's a blessing of the system that we have in America, to a certain extent, that you can't do that. But it's, those are, those are dangers. And you can see forms of possession you like, and even things like OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, that's a, a disorder of the etheric body, really. It's, um, so in the ape sphere, were those kinds of things, <coughs> they're being filtered into the ape sphere and being um, bled into it, so that's the kind of realm it's going to be. So that's going to be... I find it quite hard to imagine what this eight sphere is meant to be. Hope, you know, hopefully, we won't go in it ourselves. But yeah, yeah. you know, what would be what would be there? Can you? Well, I think you, you get. I think also every body, every being would have a slightly different experience. Of it, just as we all have a slightly different experience, of it, even in this world. But I think it's it's where your astral body is doing what it was compelled to do, and there's no way of stopping it. There's no way of even thinking about it, getting out of it. You might, you know, if you look at the Scottish play where Lady M is trying to wash the blood off her hands, you know, it's like you, you feel this karmic thing that you're trying to put right and it keeps coming back. You can't get rid of it. It's become a reality. You know, it's, um, and that's because you've been decentered from your, the ego, the higher ego. I mean, it's very complicated. When the double is only working in you, you know, and the other things are usurped. What really takes place? It's, it's not. It's it's a total lack of control of your own being, and you're driven around deterministically, like 
That's what this whole thing of materialism is, you know, that you, in an electromagnetic world, forces would be pulling you around this way and that way. You'd be driven, you'd be twitching, you know, you'd be, and you, it's that sort of thing where you, <clears throat> and I wrote a little bit in one of my dramas about the, the great spinster who spins her web, you know, and she's, she's a, like, huge electromagnetic spider who spins this web and her, you know, in, and in spiders, what's interesting, in this, it says, I say in the beginning, at first, all her children were outside her, and gradually she draws them in in a web, a great, and it's it's that, and then they become just articles, particles, you know, it's kind of, and that's, that's a kind of aromatic feminine image of the spider's web, you know, which is, which is what the web is, in a sense, it's drawing people in, taking forces from them, making them more addicted, taking more forces from them, you know, so... And that's the nature of addiction, you know. I mean, Lucifer tempts you in the astral body, pulls it out, and then it gives, that leaves an opening for Araman to get into the ether body. That's when you really go from just a mild obsession to total addictive possession, you know. You literally can't survive without your drug, you know. It's, um, <coughs> so in the Eighth Sphere, all kinds of things would happen, but essentially what it is is a sphere that arises because it denies the higher purpose and it's underpinned and controlled by the very much connected with things like electricity and magnetism where they are the only reality in that sphere you know and you can imagine that's working into your being and if you're also a transhumanist you've implanted the conduits through which those forces can have massive control because we'd be trapped in there wouldn't we yeah there's no way out of it well that's it there's no way out really i mean that's it. It's, I mean, Daniel Andrea talks about this the idea that there are certain purgatorial spheres where he describes how the beings in these kind of darknesses, and then suddenly a light appears above and something comes down, and then one being is taken up out, and they look with incomprehension. But it's, it could be that some, what he was saying is that you've paid a karmic debt, that's why you get released. If you, so what he's saying is there's no absolute permanent hells, which, you know, was originally put. Yeah. But they are, they go on, they're very strict. You, they're sentences. You have to, you, you might have to be there for a very long time until you paid off what you've, you know, gone through. When you've done that, then you can be released. It's a very, can be a very long process and very mysterious. And those beings, he describes amazing images of when souls are taken down. Uh, into the, and it's like this ship that starts to lurch and go downwards, and you can see, you know, and suddenly they're entering worlds. Some will get off there, others have to go even further. You know, it's kind of, I've often felt that even on the underground train, you know, seeing all these people, you know, so you go through this, and each thing in the state gets darker and darker, and we just, you know, it's kind of, it's an image of, you know, sitting opposite people, you know, they have a completely different spiritual journey that you have, but we're all sharing this particular thing, you know what I mean, it's like, all those things are outer images of the profound realities, you know, so. Yeah. I just wanted to take you back to something we were discussing right at the beginning, because I know a lot of people are quite confused about the nine realms into the earth. Yeah. The eight spheres are not one of them realms, I believe. Is that correct? Well, or do you want to talk a bit well, about no, them it's not the really. nine realms? No, I mean, the nine concentric spheres. What I can say is that the, the forces, the, the consciousness, the elements, the beings that, are, that dwell in them, in those nine interior spheres, would be very responsible for making the eighth sphere, the human being. It's the eighth sphere really only appears as as a final, as a result of the earth incarnation of the earth. When the earth incarnation moves up, even out of this condition of when we move well, after the seventh epoch, we move out of this condition of form, and that's when the eighth sphere would be beginning to be left behind. The further we go ahead, the more the eighth sphere is formed. The more we gain our consciousness at the higher levels, the more de definition comes to the eighth sphere. It's almost like it gets darker, because it's getting further from the light that is ascending, you know, so it becomes a defined reality. 
do you think that with um, the way people are acting at the moment, because you were talking about the bowl, in fact, what I should have started this next question with, we're using your picture at the moment mm -hmm. as this film of the bowl. Mm -hmm. So we're, you were talking about the I am when we're at the bottom yeah, of the bowl. Yeah. But again, yeah. this is the time when the adversarial forces see that we're quite weak, even though we now have the chance to ascend mm -hmm. up. How do you feel in this modern day at the moment? Because it, we seem to be living in very interesting times. Is the... How to put it? Like the... Is the spiritual impulse out there? Can we see it in people? Or do you think it is going too far in the other way and, you know, we're losing the balance? Well, I, th I think there's many. I think there are very few souls who are consciously realising what needs to be done. There's a vast group of souls who are not... Aren't, they don't know what to do. They, they are conforming to the general trend. And then there are the very relatively few who are utterly against any kind of spiritual development. And I think it's the duty of... I mean, anthroposophical society, oh, it's very open to those souls that are striving. It doesn't really do much for those souls who don't know who are in doubt. It doesn't usually go out um, because they, they would say you can't evangelize it. But you what you should do and what I think has to be done and I'm trying to do it myself is to create great works of art, imaginations that open people up. You know, you can't go on a pulpit and preach to people but you can create events that will make people think and feel new thoughts and that's that's in essential because I think if we don't then we leave it's like the whole thing with Christ and the Essenes you know he said look you're very pure in your own way but you don't go out to reach out to those who don't know you know and that's that's a risk we have to take we have to do that we have to bring our emanic forces more into the open by showing something else it's interesting this anthroposophical society it's quite they did a thing on radio the other day this comedian, he's quite a good comedian, Mark Steele. Oh, know? I love it. I watched his shows. Mark Steele was in town. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he, did well, he did one. He did one on East Grinstead. The last one he did. And, he, I mean, he, I, I was thinking, were you going to say anything about anthroposophy? Because he, he mentioned um, the Mormons and he mentioned Scientology, Scientology yep. and all that stuff. And he did actually say Forest Row. He said something slightly derogatory about, you know, Russell, no, sprout sandwiches and all sorts of stuff about alternative. It was a bit, you know, dismissive. But he didn't go into anthroposophy. I mean, it's almost like anthroposophy is so well guarded. It's, it's, it's not really known, you know. It's like in the, that in the mainstream. And it, in a way, it's got, to, it's got to do that. It's got to eventually take out this thought and bring a major challenge to the whole paradigm. And, you know, I watch these people like Jordan Peterson, they're sort of struggling and trying to say new things. And then you get someone like Stephen Fry, who's quite intelligent on one level, but being a sort of died in the bull atheist to a certain extent. You just think, uh -huh, and you just don't know, you know. The yeah, it's interesting with Stephen Fry, because obviously he makes us all laugh in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. Then he writes these books about certain mythologies, but there is still a rationalistic oh, yeah. side to him. Yeah, it's he like can't. he just can't quite no, no, yeah, leap yeah, over. No, no, no. Like what we were talking about, Jordan Peterson last time. There's that spirituality in him, but there's still something kind of holding him back from the es the deep esoteric. Yeah, I think he's. I think he's. It's interesting we talked about this earlier. The idea that talking about the people on the internet, talking about where they are, what they're. I think Jordan Peterson is very, he's a striving human being and he's, he's very much on the brink of a breakthrough, I think because he has changed massively, I mean he's, he's got immense respect for mm. religion and the Bible and all that stuff, whereas with Stephen Fry it's a sort of, you know, it was our God is just a cruel, you know, he's, he's, he's fallen into a sort of simplistic thing, he talks about God being a sadist and you say, but you don't believe in God, you know, it's a sort of illogicality. Yeah, and he's not read the New Testament that tells him that actually no, God's come no, back no, saying, no. love! No, I mean, he's, <laughs> well, of course, he's also fallen for this idea that science, like Brian Cox, is, is, got, is where the real intellectual, where the real facts are, you know. And that's really has to be challenged. You know, you, ha you can't challenge it with orthodox religion. You can 
challenge it with greater thoughts, more intricate, more organic forms of thinking, which is what we have to do. I mean, it's in here, it's in the books of Steiner, but some people find that and they can't read it. So it's, I think it's got to be taken onto another level. It's got to be taken into realms of art and all sorts well, of Well, Steiner things. said that himself, didn't he? He needed his uh, anthroposophy to be put into music and art. Yeah, yeah. Music, art, drama, everything. Yeah, yeah. In a new way, but even going beyond the jargon of anthroposophy, you've got to go beyond the words. You know, it's like, you know, if you want to talk about the Christ, you could almost say that without mentioning the name, but you could say what this being is. What is what is the astral body? Describe what it does. You don't have to say the name. You know what I mean? You could. That's what it is. You've got to loosen the thinking. And say what is real understanding? Like in a car engine, do you understand how all the parts connect? You may not know the names of any of them, but you know how it works. <laughs> you know. Whereas you can know the names of everything and not know a bit about how it works, really. You know. So it's that whole transformation of consciousness. That's that's the Michaelic. That's where the archangel Michael is vital which is cosmic intelligence, that counters the Aramanic. Because what lies ahead of us is a vast opening of knowledge and thoughts, living thoughts, of the processes of excarnation, of coming in, going out, the levels we go to. This is going to open up. This is going to be the great super science, you know, which has to come. And which the Aramanic... And it, it makes the Aramanic science look nothing. Because it's... It's arid, it's empty, it's, you know. <clears throat> but, then we, but then again, we, if you turn to the spirit, then you can redeem what you've learnt in Aramanic sense. I mean, quite interesting, his stance, you know. I, mean, I don't want to say too much. Yeah, well, yeah, we've got to be careful of what we talk yeah, about. Yeah, cause, yeah. But sometimes we have people that come to our groups that obviously have a different stance. They still read the Rudolf Steiner, but they might be looking at it more from a scientific or a more political oh, point yeah, of yeah, view. Yeah, yeah. So, because um, Steiner covers all these different, you know, what doesn't Steiner give lectures on? You know, he, he talks about everything. But for some people, like what you were saying <coughs> earlier, they don't know where, to, well, I'm paraphrasing here, they don't know where to turn. I have a lot of people that come to my channel who are dabbling but they've also gone down too many rabbit holes yeah. so they're bringing up that's why i wanted to do something on the eighth sphere because i have so many people write to me of what is the eighth sphere are we stuck in the eighth sphere how how do i make sure i don't fall into the eighth sphere and that kind of thing but they need to also look at what the spiritual implications are of you being on this planet now as a person what the planet's role in is in the whole cosmos but many people find that just too much for them yeah so we, it's trying to encourage them to find ways to look at all that. Yeah, yeah, that's why you, the artistic thing, you really gradually do it, because in, in some sense you can say we're all, the eighth sphere is forming all around us. It's already trying to form itself. So, so when those who develop spiritual consciousness move on, it will be left there as a form, you know, which, so one has to really understand, and they, you know, we're, they identify with that. Any, anyone who says we haven't got any inner life, we've got no soul, there's no such thing as after death, there's no, all that. You know that is the speaking of the eighth sphere. That's what they're doing. They may not realise it because people are living, you see, this is an interesting thing. People are living on the capital, the spiritual and soul capital of thousands of years. All the developments gone in human beings, all the art, the spiritual development, the love has, developed, has come into our present time. It's a capital. But that capital is being used up. You know what I mean? It's, and and it, unless it is renewed again, we get an income income coming in in every sense of the word, you know, that's, that will eventually be used up and then turned against us. You know, it's, and that is really the whole mystery of the Ragnarok, you know, the battle between Thor, Odin and the Fenris. Odin represents actually all that wonderful cultural, spiritual, soul heritage that ages and civilizations have given us. And Araman says it's nothing, it means nothing, it's all pointless. It's what I've got, you know, it added up to nothing, you know, basically. But now I give you this, you know, um, which is also like Gondi Shapur Academy, which, you know, the Arabistic thing, which was to take all the previous knowledge of the world, spiritual knowledge, but to take out the significance of the Christ. We don't need that. And if you do that, then you will end up with a mechanistic world conception in which you will be trapped. You know, 
If you deny that inner spark which will give you your true immortality, give you a new body, new bodies, new consciousness, new connections. We should just quickly explain, because not many people will understand what Gondeshapur Academy was. So that was, I believe it was the 600s, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, AD. It was um, a group of wise men, teachers, possibly mm, mystics mm. from all around that area that came together and started an institution. Yeah. But at some point, I think it was the year 666 or ish, Araman managed to infiltrate it. Maybe you'd like to take continue yeah, to yeah, yeah. explain it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the Harun al Rashid, this caliph of Baghdad, came under the influence of those forces. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant as he was. It was to take what the Greeks had developed, all the other streams of knowledge, but completely omit the mystery of Christ. That was nothing. And that, that laid the foundations for future materialism. Interestingly enough, though, the excesses of Gandhi Shapur Academy were put in check by Islam. You know, so Islam, the belief in a sort of divine, however aberrated it sometimes is, certainly put a check on that as a balance force. And in a way, even now, I mean, the best aspects of the Islamic world are putting a check on intense materialism. That anyone believes in anything super physical, a god of any kind, puts a, puts a check on pure materialism, you know. Um, but materialism, but also the other way around, the science puts a check on outrageous fundamentalism, you know. So they're both holding each other in balance. But then we need something which takes the best of the science and the best of the spiritual knowledge and sees how they can evolve, you know, which is what anthroposophy and things like it could do, or can do. You know. For this video, we've got your pieces of art up, and we were talking about art earlier, and so one of them is the seven stages of consciousness, so that's the cosmos going down into the bowl that we've been, and coming back up again, because our whole mission is what we're trying to encourage people, that you can ascend if you work with spiritual <coughs> science, or any kind of spiritual path, but the other pieces of art that are going with this are uh, like what you were talking about earlier of doing geometrical patterns, mm. What I like about yours, obviously, yours are all freehand. I know a lot of people that do these kinds of designs, but they're using their rulers and yeah. their, you know, little triangle... Or computers what, as well. Yes, right, yeah. things like that. But yours are all freehand, and this is the kind of thing of trying to encourage people. Doing that kind of art just take you, or takes your, your brain and your physical body, because you're doing the art... I don't want to say into another realm, because we're talking about the eighth sphere, but it, it, it helps uh, deprogram you in some ways. Maybe yeah, you can yeah, explain also, doing that. Yeah, and also awakens up. I mean, you know, I mean, I was given a book of, by Euclid, about Euclid, who really... By Euclid, yeah, because that's how old you are, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, she was around when well, Euclid was I around. Was, well, I was. I was called something else then. But we're good friends, good mates. Um, but, you know, it, it's also that that all these geometries are hidden within us. So the greatest divine principles are hidden within the incredible intricacy of all these processes. Not just in the adult, but all the processes going through birth in the womb, all these different states. And if you work without ruler, you and without that kind of external, you're, you're really trying to allow, allow these things to flow out and explore. I mean, what I do in my geometry, I think some of it's exploring what I call technosophical forms of the future, you know, but it's, it's so, it's completely different. I mean, the other end is this, this guy is an astronomer, anthroposophist guy, and he does these amazing sort of intricate things, but they're on computers, you can see it straight away. And I just think, so what? You know, I mean, it's just, and it's funny, they can never, they can't get to the shapes that I, get, I work at. It's partly by working freehand that you are opening up something different. You know. But um, I like Ari to see myself because he talks about things like what I draw sometimes. But um, yeah, I just think that's, I think so much more we've got to now also, I'm not knocking technology and art, but I'm saying it's good to develop the other side. So you can draw, you can write stuff, you know, really you don't even need to necessarily type it out. Or, and you can devise shows with minimum technological effects, mm -hmm. then, if, then if you use technology, you use it much more intelligently. But if you just 
substituting him, just giving him a big, loud, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's after a while very boring, like blockbusters. I mean, I, I have to sort of wean myself from watching stuff. I, I find, but I, I'm getting genuinely bored with certain types of films. You know, I'm way, way, the action films are the most boring ones of all. Well, they're just repetitive, aren't they? Same old story. It's the same. It's always the same old thing. Happens. <laughs> I don't understand why they think we all want to watch films of explosions. I know. Well, it's, it's all right when you've seen one or two. I mean, <laughs> actually, what's quite interesting, I did notice, you know, when you see the atomics explosion, what happens there is very interesting because what you see is something quite beautiful. You see the sort of coming around. And that's not because the atomic explosion is beautiful. What it's doing is revealing the etheric of the earth, the way it works. You know, it makes these incredible, out of this chaotic, murderous thing, the earth shapes it and makes this, you know, form. In spite, in, even though there's death in it, it is something there. I mean, explosions are interesting things, but the way they show them in the blockbusters and the action movies is not. It's just boring, you know. It's just it's so repetitive, the cliché, you know. But I think it's putting into people's minds violence, isn't it? So many films are about fighting. They do these long fight scenes. So, again, that's putting it into people's minds. Yeah. So I'm not saying we need to have lovely films where everyone's love and light, but that programming is going into people and making them probably have a violent edge within them because they're seeing it on the movie. Also, we want to... You know, we want to, uh, you know, people copy what's on TV yeah, and what's yeah, on film and things yeah. like that. You know, that's why everybody lives like, you know, the soap operas because, or like the soap operas, because it's just that, like their own lives where, so it makes them feel comfortable. It's okay my life's like that because it's like that on Bell yeah, Enders yeah. and Coronation Street and things like that. Well, I mean, I think, yeah, with the action movies, it's really that what makes them boring, most of them, they're called action movies, someone is because they have no psychological, hardly any psychological background. I mean, I've seen some very good films about gangsters, because you know, you, you're you just seeing a family, you're seeing a psychology. There was a thing called The Tourist that was on. Yes. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. And that was good. Interesting. Even yes. though it was very violent, mm. but you know there was something else there. It was more psychology, you could see, whereas the action movies sort of, you know, Jason Statham type stuff. It's just... You've seen one, you've seen them all. You kind of predict it. You know, there's no depth. And you, you say, I'm going to kill all of you. You know, you're just expendable. There's no exploration of what it is to die, really. You're just, you're just bodies all over the place. You know? <laughs> you know? It's kind of, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, as a, you know, as a kid, I mean, you, yeah, it's all very exciting. It's first time, but after a while, I mean, you need depth. I mean, uh, true crime stories are quite interesting because then you're also seeing... You can see psychological a trajectory. So when you see some inner content, that makes it much more. When you see no inner content, really, mm. it's, that's when it's really boring. Um, but it does. It makes people fall, and they you need louder and louder explosions and bigger and bigger things. But of course, that costs money. So you might show a huge cityscape. You can't do it too much because it's too expensive <laughs> you know, to do it. You know what I mean? Mind you, CGI helps a lot now, but you also, you can tell when things CGI as well. Yeah, and then it feels even more fakery, I think, when you can tell that, because I can sometimes see through that, oh no, that's a CGI thing, and not a mm. scene mm. at all, mm. or a mm. set, or... Mm. Um, so again, they're even, I was going to say, blagging us in the TV, aren't they? <laughs> like oh, TV yeah, blags yeah. us all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's interesting. I mean, it's good to watch things, just to discriminate. And even to know why things are no good is, is, is something, if you can discriminate what it, what it is about it. You know, I mean, they had two plays on the radio, three plays, actually. One was about so-called seven women who came from some place. And it, it, to me, it's just rubbish. It was sort of rubbish science fiction. It, it was also a, a sort of bad feminist thing as well. You know, and, you, and it was just the way... Because you couldn't tell who was speaking, all these things. You couldn't tell who it was on the radio. So you lost anyway. And the, the issues were just ridiculous. And there's another play I said a little about in the study group with Emma Thompson, I think. And it was just about a husband and wife. And it was about the Internet of Things. That was much more intelligent because you really saw the psychology of things we're having to deal with today. You know. and I, then another one was called Independence Day, which was just about a family. A man is separating from the kid and 
and the whole it was just so well done it was just true you know it's a true relationship thing even though those people were not initiated you knew there was it was a genuine thing and real quality so maybe they had been initiates in a past life and have somehow managed to put a little bit of their teaching well yeah i'm sure that lessons. is you know that is true a lot of writers i mean people like beckett and you know those a lot of writers have previous you know beckett some really good stuff i'm wasn't so happy about Pinter. He, interesting stuff, but I mean, he, this, this recent thing they've gone on about Kafka and Orwell. Yeah, both interesting, but they, had, they didn't really break through. I mean, that's the thing about Beckett. He was like in a hall of mirrors, which showed the limitations of the human being, but not really windows could show the possibilities. Well, no orthodox playwright does that because none of them have any kind of sense of any. You know, nearly all the successful people are not. You know, you take spiritual stuff. Well, it's getting, it's changing a bit to the mainstream. They, they don't want to make of it. You know, because <clears throat> I've always thought that I've done articles and little shows about this. I'm, I'm sure um, J. M. W. Turner was that painter was a druid in a past life. Especially yeah, right. when he goes off walking everywhere and he's painting the landscapes and he's a bit into megalithic stones. It's like he was a druid. I'm sure. Oh yeah, yeah. No, all that <laughs> stuff comes. I mean, all that. Artists, especially in the sort of nineteenth century, brought terrific stuff from previous existences. I mean, I always talk about the three characters: Nijinsky, Nietzsche, and Van Gogh, all classified as okay, having insanity. Mm. And I, I think, in a strange kind of a way, they were connected with the three kings because they, <coughs> Nietzsche, in his work, which also sounds Zarathustra, speaks about all these suns, you know, he's got this sun wheel. The whole thing is about the sun initiation. It's something that, uh, the thing about the three kings is that they came and saw the child, but they weren't there to acknowledge the mystery of Golgotha. So they didn't have that other level of resurrection that they could be sure of, you know what I mean? So they had, an, and Nijinsky also had this thing about the sun, you know, the great dancer, you know, the L'après midi d'une faune, and and of course Van Gogh, he did all these suns, you know, all these stars, yeah, and the sunflowers so, and, and, and the starry sky. And, you know, there was a, you know, was a, and he was trying to do with oils what perhaps you could only do with water, and it was it was it was a tragic thing. But I feel they were all pro from a profound previous existence, and they met. They met this darkening thing which would become the fall of the spirits of darkness, you know, the beginning of that materialism. So <clears throat> I feel to a certain extent they have to be avenged, really. They are, you know, great souls in their own ways, you know. And you listeners can also be great souls. This is why we're doing these show shows to try and encourage you to find your spiritual path. I'd like to thank you very much for doing this today, Patrick. Have you got anything coming up? I know you're starting your chats at Steiner House again in September. Yeah, Cafe Conversations, that'll be, yeah, that's in starting in September, every other Saturday. The dates will be in the programme. Um, and that'll be the Rudolf Steiner House programme, which will be on the website yeah. for those that would like to come along to those. Yeah. And um, Hopefully we'll be doing some more shows like this in the near future as well. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I, I kind of do fun on nature and animals and plants and be nice. Because I'm doing this thing on Lifeways, which is really nature walks, walking around talking about plants and trees and insects and various things like that, you know. So. Well, that'll be our next show then. I look yeah. forward to it. Thank yeah. you very much, Patrick, yeah, and well. thank you everybody for listening. Okay. <laughs>